So where did you grow up yourself? Uh, just in a small town called Walkerton that's a couple hours north of Toronto. Mm. How small are we talking? I think it was at the time 6,000 people. Okay. Yeah. Bigger or smaller now? It's probably like a thousand people bigger, right. maybe 7,000 now. Right. Still, when I visit it, it's still the same little town. Awesome. Uh, so how did you end up um, developing video games? Or how did you first get a love for video games? Uh, yeah, I remember, I remember my interest was very, very. Spe I remember it very specifically back when I was uh, in grade eight even. My brother was starting high school and he was telling me about the Apple II Plus computers they had at school and I was just fascinated. So I hadn't even touched one and he would bring his books home about how to do programming for them. So I was just fascinated by the idea. And we were playing Dungeons and Dragons at the time. And so I remember even before I touched a computer, I was writing out little print statements on paper and made my own little game basically in my head written down. And then it wasn't until I got into grade nine where I got to actually get my hands on that. And I'd come in early in the morning right. into, uh, into school, uh, yeah, an hour early just to mess around on the, on the Apple II Pluses. Amazing. Uh, compiling on paper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on paper, and then I started inputting them and just messing around and, and just learning. And, and it wasn't until I think about a year later that uh, uh, we, my brother and I pooled our money and our parents helped us buy our first Apple II Plus computer, and that's mm -hmm. kind of when it really took off. So how did, obviously this is an era before you could go to university and study how to do game design or, or oh, yeah, absolutely. programming at that stage. So how did you, what was the transition like from being an enthusiast as a child to then eventually starting a company? Yeah, it's, the transition was um, that in my head, like it always, like through grade nine, all the way through to the end of university, I always had in my head that I would do uh, uh, games just in my spare time as a hobby. It was always a hobby in my head. It was never... There was never any thought that it would be a full-time job. I remember at the time, uh, EA, or before EA, was Distinctive Software out in Vancouver when I was in university, had co-op work terms. And mm. I applied, of course, uh, I wasn't getting, wasn't getting into a real job in games, so I, I kind of put that out of my head. But yeah, I'd made games all throughout university. I went to university for mechanical engineering mm. and expected to go into mechanical engineering. And uh, uh, one of the little games I was making... Uh, through university, I got published in this little kind of magazine disc thing called Big Blue Disc. Mm. That would be on, you'd see it on the magazine shelves, and it would come out monthly. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I was just looking around for something to do with my game that I finished, which is kind of a cool little game. And I sent it to them, and they paid me my $1,200 right. for the rights to do that. And so I just I was amazed that I actually made a little bit of money from right. this, this tiny little game. And so that's kind of the first stepping stone to, to get it to the professional and actually uh, money coming in. What was the game? It was called Legends of Murder. <laughs> you can search it online and probably find it. I think That's I found it somewhere. a fantastic title. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually works. I was just playing it a couple months ago. You right. can download it somewhere and it's, uh, yeah, it's a funny, funny little game. So was that the point where you were thinking, oh, actually, this might be a viable source of I still thought at that point it would be a hobby in that, and I thought it'd be fantastic if I could make a little bit of extra income from that. Mm -hmm. And so as I was finishing university, I uh, was making, you know, I'd be making bigger and bigger games. And I made this one um, game after, you know, was a big fan of uh, Star Trek at the time. And it was kind of, and then a game called Star Control had come out. And I just loved this idea in my mind of combining those two things. And I ended up making this game called Solar Winds, which was just finishing up as I was graduating university. And right around that time, I knew this game was a little bit bigger, a little bit more interesting, a little bit more viable as a, as a real product. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, remember playing uh, Hugo's House of Horrors, which was a shareware game at the time. And I actually physically wrote an actual letter to David Gray. I right. do believe his name is. I can't believe I remember that. And <laughs> I sent the letter off to him, I asked, you know, can people make money from shareware because you're giving it away for free? And he wrote back and he told me about CompuServe, it was a good online um, area where people discuss games and, and shareware and stuff like that. And he said, yeah, some people make a few bucks and some people make a million dollars. And of course that, you know, my mind exploded. And I think from there, that's where I got onto CompuServe and I found out about Apogee and Epic Games. And I got in contact with uh, with those guys, and uh, uh, yeah, that and that first game, Solar Winds, ended up. Uh, I met Mark Rain, and and the first game ended up being published by 
by Epic, Epic Mega Games at the time. Right. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic experience and I got to meet other developers and that was kind of the start of, of the whole thing just as I was graduating university. So I was fortunate to never actually have a real job, <laughs> much to the disappointment of my parents at the time because I was graduating university, I had a really great job offer and then I declined it to make my, my games that were barely making any money at the time. Right. Yeah, I think there was an eight-month period where, I, or a six-month period where I wasn't making um, pretty much anything, and then Solar Winds came out and I was making a little bit of money, enough right. to survive on. You weren't living at home at this age. No, no, or? I was still out and just yeah, finished up university and and just living in cheap places, and I, I just loved it because it was like I was, I think I was making about twelve hundred dollars a month from Solar Winds. And I was like working on my next game. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to go from $1,200 a month to $2,400 a month. <laughs> so I can actually live reasonable on that. And so uh, it was exciting times. And I just loved the work. And the game that came after that was Epic Pinball. Right. And so uh, as I was making, I was like, okay, this is good. This, this game is, this is my best yet. It's going really well. And so I was really quite uh, excited about it, thinking, yeah, maybe I'll make more than $2,400 a month. Maybe I'll make three thousand. It's like in my mind, oh my god, four thousand dollars a month. I would be living in luxury. And of course, it it comes out, and it was a monster. Like for for individual, for one person making, it was a monster hit. And I just, I just remember my first check was like fifty thousand dollars. So it was, yeah, it was a whole new world. And that was kind of the the start of the upward climb. Right. I think when you're when we're outside people looking in, we think about game studios as having very sort of uh, competitive uh, relationships with each other. Mm. But those early years, with between yourselves and, and Epic, um, it's incredibly collaborative. Oh, it's, it's everybody like, was collaborative, right? and, it, and it's interesting. It's like even back then, unless you're making a directly competing game, which wasn't uh, wasn't too often, it was very collaborative with everybody. And I find that these days as well. Like now that we're doing free to play, there's very little, very few games that you find that kind of eat into your territory, right. um, where you see customers being drawn. So it's like really, I think it's, it's, you're much more able to be collaborative because you don't have this, when you're doing free to play, because you don't have this big collision of two big products mm. potentially coming out at the same time. Not necessarily, it's, it's just much more free flowing, I think with the, with the free to play because it is, it's much more longer term right so for that kind of stuff uh, our view is like it's a much less you still want to do well but it's a much less com directly competitive landscape just right. like it was back in those days as well yeah. so let's talk a little bit about the collaboration over unreal then uh how did that all come about because you guys were like instrumental in the entire conceptualization yeah. of that yeah right? we co-created epics unreal it's uh we i was researching 3d programming after uh, Epic Pinball while Extreme Pinball was being done because I was fascinated by that. And then, um, you know, I think we collectively thought moving to retail was where the bigger games were going to be. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so, so Tim Sweeney had hired some people and, and I had hired my guys and we, we collaborated on, and it took a, a number of years for the, for the product to finally come out. But yeah, it was a really it was a really fascinating time <clears throat> and a lot of, I think we were all, we were very lucky on all sides to have some extremely talented people that we, we collectively found and worked with um, that have clearly gone on to do amazing things themselves. Right. So yeah, it was, it was a crazy wild time and we were working literally for a while there, 80 hour work weeks right. and it was, it was certainly tough trying to get that, that baby shipped. Were you heading into North Carolina? Were they coming up here? For uh, Unreal, mm. they came up here. And then for Unreal Tournament, we went down there. Just the group, the group of people was, uh, I think um, it was really, really high pressure. Mm. Uh, Unreal Tournament was a lot more enjoyable, right. uh, but Unreal shipping that big product, uh, just the people, like just, I just remember Tim worked the hardest. He was always at the computer and working with uh, Cliff Blazinski. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was a great group of people that really, uh, really pulled out all the stops like everybody everybody was incredibly committed to mm. to making a great product so it was yeah i think that's my biggest memory it's just like we were there all the time you know there's arguments and uh but but generally a really intense but very memorable experience right. like everybody would everybody on that team would say it's hard to forget all 
you know, or not not that you want to forget, but it's just like it was so intense and so uh, such a big deal that it was uh, um, all of it was memorable. Mm. And then I guess the train kept rolling because the UT was originally sort of going to be like some sort of expansion of content. Yeah, pack, right. Yeah, it was a, an expansion pack, and we all were just, and it was much more relaxed. I think doing Unreal tournaments, so we all. Uh, I think it's we were super passionate about Unreal, but Unreal Tournament I felt became more creative because we felt we had a little more time, hmm. um, and a, and a lot of people did some amazing extra things. It was super collaborative, and that if somebody had an idea, they'd try it out. We discuss it, and it it I think that's what ended up allowing us to get so much stuff into the game. Right. And what really made it shine? So it was, it was, yeah, definitely one of the most interesting ex development experiences. Like as intense as Unreal, intense as Unreal was, and and hard, and really just trying to ship a game. Unreal Tournament was, I think, more felt more creative and right. more a little less pressure, but that allowed us to make even a better game. I think. And you can kind of see that in the end product, and that like, if you do the you know oft made comparison with, with yes. Quake Three, which had come out that same year, right? There's like Unreal Tournament, in terms of level design and weapon design, and even character skin design and stuff, is, yes. is super wide. It's like all over the place. Absolutely, yeah. It was a very, a very creative process, and we didn't. It's funny because we didn't have a specific direction, so everybody mm -hmm. was kind of um, moving in a certain. Like, like I said, people would try something, and it's oh, that's cool, or it doesn't work, and and it was yeah, very, very creative. Right. I think everybody was pushing for creative. Creativity. What, what was your sort of role on that project? Were you doing like everything? Were you programming? I was. I, yeah. I mean, I think by that time, my programming because we had so many skilled programmers mm -hmm. uh, at that point. So my programming went down. My programming contribution went down, and I think I focused more on the art and weapon. I can proudly say I think all the weapon designs are mine for the most oh, really? part. So. Um, yeah, I think that would be my proudest accomplishment on Unreal and Unreal Tournament. It's like doing the design for the weapons and the art and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. But what yeah, I was trying to fill in the gaps basically. Yeah. What are some of your favorite weapons from? Oh, UC? the flat cannon has always <laughs> always been my favorite. I was very happy with how that one turned out. Right. Did you put the smiley face at the end? I of did. The alt fire. I did. <laughs> I did. On the first one, yeah, that was me. And the rocket launcher was pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Did you come up with the redeemer? Yes. And do you know that's? Uh, I'm not sure if this story's ever been told. We were all in North Carolina, and uh, we were coming back from lunch somewhere, and we walked past uh, a church called the Redeemer. And it's like, hey, that's a great name for the big guy. So, <laughs> wow. walking past a church in in Raleigh, North Carolina, right. and so we got the name Redeemer, a palatable nuclear weapon, yes, named after a church. Yes, great. <laughs> Um, can I, do you mind if I ask you a couple more about the weapons? Sure. Just because it's yeah, an yeah. interesting vein. Um, the, I, one of the things that p people love about UT was just the old fires were so yeah. uh, interesting. And then the, like something like the shock rifle where you were actually right. creating like a third fire and right. combining the two yes. of them. Um, do you remember coming up with those? Like, I don't remember specifically. I remember we were all discussing... Um, I know Cliff had a lot of input mm. in, in the weapons as well, but we wanted something that was more, more than just basic shooting. Um, and we loved the ways that, you know, potential um, combining the alt fires to add an extra layer of skill on mm. top. So we we're always looking for a way to add that, um, you know, you, you shoot the weapon in its basic form and you can do well. But if you have that extra skill and you can do the, the combos or, mm. or, or whatever, that there's an extra layer of skill that's kind of built on top of the weapons. Uh, so that was definitely the intention as much as we possibly could. Like the sh the rocket launcher, where you can fire it like five different ways, almost. Yes. So yeah. Like yeah. Circle exactly. Circle together or yeah, wide. Or... Exactly. So that was yeah. I think the yeah the one alt fire mode wasn't as good on that one, but yeah, that was the intention is to always look for something, mm -hmm. some way that it could either the alt fire and regular fire could become combined with itself mm -hmm. or with other weapons or, or yeah, as much as we possibly could. Do you have any favorite maps from that original ninety nine one? Uh, Facing worlds. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Cedric's uh, map was definitely one of one of our favorites that we played in the office. There was a lot. There was a lot of really good ones. I like uh, Deck Sixteen was awesome. Uh, it was Misha's map that was very memorable. Right. I think those are the two that stick out in my head. And probably the, the two that are still played the most. Yeah, right? that might be. Yeah. That might be. And then there are some really good ones that we did uh, at DE, like to like after mm. after the game came out that 
or that might have been Unreal, Unreal Championship that we added that to. No, no, we did some from Unreal Tournament so long ago. It's right. hard to remember. Yeah. Um, so what was what was the collaboration like then on the rest of the Unreal games? Because obviously you had the console game and then 2003, right. 2004. Yeah, it was, the teams got bigger as well. So. Yeah, there was. Um, it was again very collaborative, but we were in different spots at this point. So uh, we, uh, I think, l yeah, Unreal Championship we were doing up here with Unreal Tournament 2003, and then most, almost entirely all of 2004 was Epic, mm -hmm. I do believe. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was difficult to work separately like that. And as the teams got bigger, and then as we, each of the companies got focused on different things, it, right. it didn't, we would have loved to continue the, the the partnership on that, but it just became, I think, too difficult, mm. and you know the companies were growing and, and moving off in our separate directions. But yeah, they were they were fantastic to work with. We had some uh, good money coming in. Mm. We weren't that big. We were quite successful, uh, but we had our eye on like you know, let's make something like the next Halo, like something huge, mm. right? Because the games were at that point were getting bigger and bigger, and that was exciting to us. And we wanted to be you know triple A, huge, biggest games, and so. We'd come up with a demo or pitching ideas to publishers looking to use uh, their money to make mm. some product. And it was definitely a challenge that went on with us for many, many years looking for, those, for that product of our own. Right. Uh, when possibly the best, although I can't complain how things turned out, but possibly the best, better decision at the time would be to have been taken our own money and made our own small little mm. product that was fully funded ourselves, that wasn't wasn't striving to be that big massive right. blockbuster. But that's a lot, that's your own money, it's more risky. You could, more risky, yeah. but then you have full control over it because just um, when you're doing a work for hire pro project, I mean, it's their money, so mm -hmm. you're doing what they want and there's you, maybe you never know exactly what they want or they don't know what they want. Right. And it's, uh, it's always in, if you look at our history and most independent studios' history, when they have full control, complete control over the product they're making, mm -hmm. Uh, which often only comes if you're funding it yourself, you will make a better product right. because you're more passionate about it. It's like fully, fully yours. There's, you know, even that layer of not in necessarily interference, but that layer of collaboration between the developer and the publisher kind of waters things down potentially right. if there's miscommunication. But it's, uh, it, it's trickier. It's trickier is an easy way to put it. And it's like there's not many studios, independent studios that can manage mm. that kind of, um, clearly some of them do it really well, but right. it's, it's definitely adds a layer of challenge to the process. What are some of the ones that stand out to you? Uh, the one that, when you say that, the one that jumps to mind is uh, both Dark Sector and mm. The Darkness 2, which are, uh, the Darkness 2 is awesome to work mm. on because yeah, 2K was, uh, was fantastic to work with. They really were super supportive. And uh, yeah, and then uh, Dark Sector was kind of, um, uh, as we know, like kind of the precursor to right. Warframe many years before, and it's something that everybody was super passionate about, and many elements of that turned out really fantastic. And that was, uh, um, yeah, I think a really exciting project for everybody to work on. So in that time, or obviously we were talking to some of the uh, other folks about the, the process of pitching games, and then they're saying like, oh, well, that seems like it might work, but why don't you work on this other IP we already have, or something like that. Throughout that process, was there ever a point where you did get to make your own? You were, you were Dark Sector is, looks yeah. like it's about as close as you got, yes. right? Where yep. they were kind of like, we like that, but like maybe twist yeah. it this way a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Like it was, um, you can see the difference between what Dark Sector was and what Warframe is mm. in terms of kind of the look and feel. And I mean, that's the difference between what the publisher at the time wanted with a the game. Uh, they wanted something that was more grounded and, and more uh, uh, kind of set in reality that people could relate to. Right. Uh, but yeah, uh, that, that said, uh, we did have a huge amount of, of uh, creative input as to what the product mm. would be. It was sort of here was the guidelines and then we got to entirely make the game cool. ourselves. Yeah. And that can be, uh, creative restrictions are often good as well. Uh, absolutely, like, yeah, yeah. I don't want to, you know, uh, like setting something in grounded in reality is, is a great idea. It makes a lot of sense. Like there's so many successful games that, you know, are set in the real world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's definitely an argument for, for doing that, for sure. So let's talk about a little bit closer to, to sort of when Warframe started to be yeah. uh, uh, worked on. Um, 
could you see were you like reading the tea leaves in, in terms of like there was less money going out to independent developers was there yeah. less of this type of work yep. for you guys less work for hire yes and it was definitely i mean you talk to any kind of mid-sized developer even these days i think it's a uh and especially back then it was a huge challenge because the games were becoming bigger and bigger and uh, the mid-sized games, it was really even more hit or miss mm. if they were to even gain any traction in retail. I mean, there's the growing um, growing element of digital, digitally downloaded games, right. which a lot of people were again, becoming successful. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a very challenging time, and it was, it was definitely hard to get those, to work with a publisher to get those real potentially high quality products mm. funded because there was so much at stake the, like to compete uh, you need to put more money in them and then we at that time we were, were were looking at free to play and we heard amazing things about some of the more i mean world of tanks is, right. is the most perfect example they did phenomenal and uh it was a great game it, you know it wasn't uh i don't know what the budget was but it mm. clearly wasn't like a hundred million dollar budget to ship that out the door right. and we love the idea of the fact that you know you can initially ship, ship something smaller and you, we'd seen this in a few other games and then grow beyond there mm. so it really seemed really appealing to us that that concept where you could try something out see if the fans like it and then grow as needed right so we knew we needed to do something different because even through this whole this time span of these these past 25 years as with the successes we had uh, there was many times when we were just skimming the bottom mm. close to bankruptcy and it was just just horribly difficult to go through that and so we'd have these you know great amazing times and and ship some amazing products and then there'd be you know when you've got especially when you have 200 people right. 250 people it is scary as hell to not have work lined up right and the, yeah, the you're only as, and it's, this is more true in our industry for in work for hire you're only good as the last game because everybody's looking at the metacritic score of your last right. game and if it's not good you're you're you know becomes that much more difficult to to get some quality product signed up and it sounds like the studio here hasn't like there's a lot of studios which which scale up and scale down yep. quite a lot and it doesn't seem like that is that's no, the case here i well for my personal pr like i would do anything to not have to do that mm. it's a very uh, you know we've we've had a few minor layoffs in the past but it would be that's always like the absolute last resort right. for us for sure so it's uh i mean especially i mean even more so because we're in london ontario right. it's like where where's anybody going to go and if you know it's it's just would be the last thing we would do right was there ever a consideration to be bought out by a publisher so to not to give yeah away that's benefit. an interesting um we had certainly were interested in, in the possibility of something like that but the value of de before warframe was almost zero right. so <laughs> um yeah it's like as a work for hire studio you know we we own the dark sector ip but mm. You know, and it was moderately successful, but it, there really wasn't a lot of value there. We had our own technology, which mm -hmm. has some value, but um, as a studio to be purchased uh, at, at, during that kind of time, it was it was pretty unlikely that right. that was a possibility. There's probably more people knocking on your door now. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> clearly, yeah. It's yeah, it's a whole new, completely different ball game when you've got a product that's bringing in revenue 24 hours right. a day, right? Mm -hmm. So. So let's talk about the um, uh, the decision to uh, go free to play. Yes. Because obviously you said you know there's this this, this plucky developer out of Belarus that's got now the twenty yeah. studios around the world or whatever twenty offices around the world um, making this game that the mainstream gaming press isn't even really considering yep. all that much. Yeah. Um, who else were you looking at in terms of free to play? Was it scary the idea that like because you're not oh, swimming? Oh, completely. In it was our last. It was a hail mary. It was right. like it really was. How close to closing were you guys? Or how close to, to bankruptcy? Or? Yeah, really close. Really close. Yeah, uh, I can tell that story. It was pretty. Uh, it was super close. It was. We knew that this was our last chance, and we had a couple million dollars extra, mm. like to do this with. And yeah, we studied. We studied all the games out there. A couple, like uh, a game called Drakensang, which mm. I really enjoyed at the time, and World of Tanks, and uh, um, 
was it Battlefield Heroes? I think right, had done yeah. all right uh, as a as a more Western game in the free to play market. Um, so we're looking at anything, anything out there that looked <coughs> like it was uh, sustaining itself, and that's all we wanted is like find a self sustaining product that could pay for itself. And so, yeah, we took. I, I told Steve and the guys, you know, you got uh, you got twelve months. That's it. There's like nothing but twelve months. Mm. And uh, they planned it, they executed it perfectly. They got, uh, they got through and we got right to the end there and it's, uh, you know, we, 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 we found the start of a small little audience and we turned on the, the monetization. Mm. And I think some of the choices we made there were really excellent and, and a, a little bit of luck because we didn't know what we were doing at all. Right. And it, and it kind of got its feet under, under itself to support itself just as you know, we were running out of money. Right. And so it launched and, and we saw it did well. And then it wasn't until we launched on Steam that we knew we were saved. Because right. we were, we knew leading up to the Steam launch, it was making enough money to sustain a small team. But we were 250 people. Right. And so it's like, we're sweating. It's like, okay, so let's turn on Steam and see uh, how many people we can support. And we turned it on, and it and it jumped, mm. and it was. I think it started off certainly enough to support the entire studio, and then I think one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why Warframe continued its upward climb is then all of a sudden we had 250 people working on Warframe. Right. Right. So we did up to that point, but then our updates were so monstrous. Like it's, it's a really. It wasn't an orchestrated decision because we were also looking for work for hire work at the time mm. <laughs> to support the team. But we, yeah, we had a project that kind of fell out at that point. Mm. Uh, so yeah, we had everybody working on Warframe and I think because the updates were so ambitious and big with that many people working on it, it certainly allowed the game to grow right. uh, much more rapidly. So it really was, we were, we were right close to not making it there. How, obviously, that was a conscious decision to then put more people on the project. The other decision that could have been made is that you allow that to just be its own self-sustaining thing right. and don't try and upscale it up because there's the worry that if you put many people on it, maybe it doesn't scale up. Yeah, so, and uh, that's what many people would say. Many right. people, we talked to other people in the free-to-play industry and they said, you're screwed. They said, they first of all saw that it was uh, PVE, mm. they saw it was sci-fi, and they said, you're gonna, for many months, even after it was successful, people were saying your game is going to be dead in six months, right. because and so because it's been tried before, and yeah, and I think because we had so many, so many people and so many talented people working on it, really, each update was so substantial. It really helped build it bigger. So, yeah, the the. In, it was accidental that we had so many people on it, but it was really the only, once it was making enough money, it was clearly the the right thing to right. do to keep going. There was no other choice. And there's a difference between, it seems like a lot of free-to-play studios, or many of them, are quite young studios who then sort of upscale right. to, to work on a project, yeah. whereas you were working yeah. with people who had decades worth of experience. That probably right. makes a big difference as well. Yeah, I think I think it's certainly yeah, it's a very unique situation that we had, no doubt, um, and something that I don't think anybody else would have the the luck or the ability to mm. do to have that many people ready at the exact right time, ready to go. Uh, Warframe also seems to be out uh, in a time where a lot of, in terms of the, I don't know how the word is exactly right, but a lot of shooters are playing are acting quite safe in terms of not just their gunplay, but also in terms of the worlds that they create. Right. Like they're quite like similar to ours, or right. ours maybe yes. a little bit in the future. Warframe is, it's like watching European sci-fi or yes. something. It's yeah. this completely yep. different. And it's interesting because I'm starting to figure out that perhaps what looked like maybe a barrier to entry is also maybe your like unfair advantage, is that you have this very idiosyncratic or very like unique world yes. that once people are sort of in on, then they, they feel really, they belong to it. I think you're entirely correct. That is absolutely, because when we first started making Warframe, uh, my background, as I mentioned, is, is more on the art side. Mm. And uh, my directive to the guys was make whatever you want. Like, let's just make sure we do the free to play right. right. You make what you're excited about. And so our director, 
is monumentally talented. He just wanted to make what he loved, and I'm, I'm seen as like, oh, like that's a, it's a little different. And then, but I'm like, yeah, do whatever you want, do right. whatever makes you happy. Like, do what you are passionate about, which is a clear advantage, I think, for Warframe mm. itself is the passion of the team. And then when we showed it to uh, the game to some 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 bigger like. Uh, um, Free to play publishers in the world, they're like, oh, I got it's it's sci-fi and it's a really different looking sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Like, who's gonna like that? And so, we're like, at one at one point, Steve and I met, and we had one of these really disappointing. And the game was almost ready to launch, like I think two months before, two months before it launched. And we had a big meeting with one of these big publishers, and and they just laid it out there, like you're you're screwed. Like right. you hear here are the things you're clearly, clearly doing wrong. And and Steve and I were just so depressed. It's like we're just like we're fucked. Like mm. we're we're in trouble because <laughs> we're two months. We can't and we're like we can't change it. Right. We're we're not changing it. Let's see where it goes. And so um yeah, but I think you're right. In the end it's it's different and it's different enough that it uh appeals to a certain crowd mm. and they get in there and that's the world. Right. And that's it's a unique world. Where do, why do you think Warframe succeeded in the ways that they thought it wasn't going to? Why do you think, do you think it was filling a niche that they just hadn't considered? Or do you think you were scared enough because of everything they were telling you that you were able to pivot your way to success? Yeah, I think it's, it's a combination of those things. I think it's um, number one, and I think it will always be this, is like the passion of the team. Like it's, it's so clear, as I've said in our uh, 25 year history, any time we've had the ability to, to do whatever we wanted mm -hmm. with no restriction, it's always been really good. Right. And so that was my mandate for this, is it's like, there's no restrictions, like just, other than just like, have it commercially viable with the correct monetization and doing learning to do free to play right, just make the game that you want, that, you're, that the team's excited about. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, um, yeah, the passion of the team is probably the number one thing, just doing what they want to do. And then, what would be the secondary aspect? Yeah, I'm not sure. I would, I would put it all the weight on that. Mm. Yeah. Are you done doing uh, work for hire projects now? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. That's <laughs> that's a different. It's really is a different world. I right. mean the. I mean, Warframe is, is all, like I think, I mean, it's been announced, we're doing another project. We were doing another project internally, but Warframe is just, I mean, as we saw, as you saw in the, the, the Steam charts of uh, Warframe when we had our Planes of Eidolon update, it just, we were wondering if we were near the limit of where Warframe could be, but right. no, it's, it keeps going up. So uh, there's that demand within the studio to have everybody really helping out and still being passionate about Warframe to, to increase that, you know, see how big we can make it. So it'll be interesting just to see where the life, and it's such a new thing, like the way we've done Warframe, that it will be very interesting to see the path it takes over the next few years. But yeah, absolutely, the plan is to, uh, to keep growing it as big as possible, try to make it as popular as possible, but keep that um, passion and, and excitement for what it is and where it's going. I mean, the Plains of Eidolon, again, is a great uh, example of how Warframe is what it was, and now it's, it's grown in a really, really interesting way that was super compelling to the fans. Mm. And uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more of that kind of stuff coming, so it'll be really interesting to see how the game evolves and what it becomes, right. because it's, with so many people working on it, and with such an expandable concept for a game, or an expandable premise, mm. Who knows where it could go, but it'll become bigger and really, really interesting. And presumably that's important to you as well, m you know, managing a studio of creative people in that you haven't sort of shoehorned this whole team into making this very specific game. Like right. being able to have the creative agency to say, oh, we'll do an open world thing. Like I'm sure it's as important to the fans. It's probably very important to the culture of the studio as well. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I think that's critical. I think it's... Um, for the longevity of Warframe, having that type of game where it can be expanded in different ways, because many free-to-play ca games can't be. They're, they are what they are, and it's like, where else are you gonna grow it? Yeah. But Warframe can, so I think it's critically important for the team to continue to be passionate about yeah. it. Like, if all it was is making new weapons and new game modes, you know, at some point, it's gonna become tedious and boring, yeah. and it's like, 
people would need a new creative outlet, and that's where a new game would come in. Right. But with Warframe, you can expand it in these really spectacular new ways, mm. and uh, uh, keep the team in extremely engaged because they need to be passionate and engaged to keep the fans mm. passionate and engaged about the the product itself. Uh, last question. We've asked everyone this one. If you had three words to describe Warframe to somebody, uh, what would it be? What would they be? <laughs> uh, Everyone's had to take like 30 seconds to come up with this, so feel free to have time if you need it. Fun, fast, and cooperative. Nice. Yeah, right. I think I've just, uh, those, those kind of resonate in my head because a lot of the games I've been playing with my kids lately have mm -hmm. been cooperative, and we're just, like that experience, that element of, of Warframe, I think, is a real... Uh, compelling part of it, the cooperative aspect that you're doing something with your friends right. and, and because it's PvE, you're going out and fighting the enemies, mm. it's, uh, I think it really resonates with people. Are your kids old enough to play Warframe yet? They do. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, it's, they're, they're getting into it, which is surprising, <laughs> so they, they think I'm pretty cool. Have they played Unreal Tournament? They haven't. They haven't, they haven't played Unreal Tournament. That's, I mean, if you go back and play that now, that's pretty <laughs> high skill yeah. type game. Those uh, facing world headshots don't yeah. aim themselves. Oh my god, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough. <laughs>